silicon was so last year. I mean, don't get me wrong. If you want to throw down a few billion logic transistors for an SOC, silicon is still pretty good stuff. But when it comes to power transistors, we can get serious advantages with wideband gap materials. Now, if you're thinking, hey, Amelia, I like the Bee Gees and Metallica. Isn't that a pretty wide band gap? Well, yes, and no, that's not what we're talking about at all. I'm talking about wide band gap semiconductors. And no, a semiconductor is not a guy who stands in front of an orchestra and sort of waves his arms around. Okay, I'll stop with the music jokes. I mean, of course, materials like gallium nitride, which have much wider band gaps than silicon's 1 1.5 electron volts, allowing us to achieve much higher voltages, frequencies, and temperatures. And that'll get us some serious ACDC. <laughs> okay, no more musical jokes, I promise. Hi, I'm Amelia Dalton, host of Chalk Talk. Today, my guest is Bob Golly from Panasonic, and we're going to explain how to take advantage of wide band gap gallium nitride transistors in your next power design. But before we get started, don't forget to click that link. There you can find out more information about gallium nitride transistors from Panasonic. Hi, Bob. Thank you so much for joining me today. Oh, hello, Amelia. How are you? Thank you for coming in. I'm great, Bob. Thank you for asking. Okay, so GAN devices are new. Can you tell me a bit about what Panasonic has been doing in this space? GAN devices or GAN powered devices are new, but not so new. New to the market, but Panasonic has been developing GAN compound semiconductor devices for well over 15 years, from optical to power devices with the front end processing done in house. We've learned a lot on how to develop reliable and robust power devices by design, process control, material control, and device testing. Oh, by the way, the trademark for Panasonic's GAN power devices is XGAN. So, what type of devices do you have? Currently, we have two mid-power devices in mass production, the 190 milliohm max and 70 milliohm max in an 8x8 surface mount DFN package. Both devices, along with several related chopper and half-bridge evaluation boards, are available and in stock at Mauser. We have plans to roll out more devices in 2018 for lower power and higher power applications. Now, where would I use these different devices? GAN-powered devices are used, well, first off, Panasonic's focus has been on 600-volt rated GAN devices used for AC to DC power supplies, inverters, and high-voltage DC-DC. Our current products and plans for 2018 will cover a wide range of power from 45-watt small AC adapters up to around 3 kilowatts for customers who are looking for high efficiency and high power density for data centers and light industrial applications. So, Bob, can you tell me more about your GAN device? How do you make it? Working with GAN, you would think, oh, it's going to be a pure GAN material. Well, difficulty is GAN wafers or pure GAN wafers are limited in size and very, very expensive. To make a competitive device in GAN, the power semiconductor industry is focused on making a lateral GAN device using wafers from other materials such as silicon, sapphire, and silicon carbide. GAN on silicon provides the lowest cost option with good thermal conductivity but has high thermal stress due to the temperature coefficient of expansion mismatch between the GAN epilayers and the silicon substrate, which may lead to wafer cracks. GAN and silicon don't like each other. Critical to the device reliability is to find a way for the GAN and silicon to get along. With our in-house front-end process, Panasonic developed a super lattice buffer to reduce the stress to have good uniformity, crack-free, and mirror surface. We're running six-inch wafers and investigating eight-inch wafers. Okay, so can we zoom in a bit more and get under the hood and see how these things work? Sure. GAN power devices work due to the very high electron mobility in the two deg or two-dimensional gas between the GAN and the AL GAN layers. The two deg is created by piezoelectric and polarization effect between the GAN and the AL GAN layers. Note that GAN is a normally on device because of the two deg, so it needs to be converted to a normally off device. We'll cover that a little bit more later. So, this is a new device. I assume customers are using this for the first time. 
Anything that's jumped out to you as an issue to watch out for? Yes, there is an inherent reliability concern for GAN power devices. High dynamic already is on, which can lead to current collapse. Crystal dislocations can occur in the GAN epitaxial layer due to the compressive strain when growing GAN on the silicon wafer. The crystal dislocations can be mitigated to a certain extent by the super lattice buffer layer, but dislocations will still occur. Electron trapping occurs on the surface and the bulk of the GAN, which may be caused by the crystal dislocations. The number of tracked electrons has a VDS, voltage drain to source correlation. The higher the electric field, the more electrons are trapped. Trapped electrons block the drain current flow and increase the RDS on. As the on resistance increases, the device can heat up, negatively impact reliability of the device. Dynamic RDS on can be significantly higher than the RDS on reported on the data sheet. This is a dynamic condition while the GAN device is being switched on and off, especially at high voltage. So the higher the voltage, the higher the electric field, the more electrons are trapped. Okay, so if I have a current collapse, how do I know if I have it and how do I test it? That was a tough question. It took a while to develop. We consider that current collapse might affect the high temperature operating lifetime. The JEDEX standard test for silicon powered devices is a static test condition. It doesn't cover a dynamic condition. Again, dynamic RDS on is a dynamic condition. We had to consider test methods including HTOL beyond the JEDEX silicon standard test method that were suitable for GAN dynamic RDS on. As a side note, a new JEDEX standards committee, JC70, Wide Band Gap Power Electronic Conversion Semiconductors, was recently convened to establish quality Qualification, test, and datasheet standards for GAN and silicon carbide. Panasonic is a participating member to help establish the new GAN standards. Okay, so can you get into a little more detail on the reliability of GAN? For a new technology, Panasonic deeply had to understand the inherent reliability matters for GAN devices. We listed three key points for reliability, thermal stress, dynamic RDS on, and field market data simulation. Thermal stress, leakage, and aging could be covered by the JEDEX silicon standard static test. Current collapse to gauge the reliability under a dynamic condition would need testing beyond the JEDEX standard for dynamic RDS on and HTOL. We also considered the key items for a robust device, such as no avalanche, low VGS breakdown, and a normally on device. So where did you start your investigation for reliability? Well, we started our investigation for reliability with the JEDEC standard silicon tests, and we ran the battery of the JEDEC test on everything, and it passed. This provided a piece of the reliability information, but sorry to repeat, the key issue for GAN reliability is dynamic RDS on, which is beyond the JEDEC silicon standard test condition. So you mentioned that JEDEX standards don't cover everything, and you had to look beyond that. So what are some of the things you found? So we started looking for a few steps beyond JEDEX. We wanted to start with field test data, but we didn't have a lot of devices in the market yet. We decided to test a large number of device under test, or DUT, under an accelerated test condition, HTRB, to simulate field test data. An accelerated test condition was used equivalent to 10 years lifetime under junction temperature 100 degrees C, voltage drained to source of 480 volts. A total of 10,000 devices were run, 500 pieces from 20 lots were tested. No defects for a total of 1 billion device hours, or 10K pieces by 100K hours, for a fit rate of 10 or less. So you said GAN is normally on device. Is that a problem or a safety issue? Yes. So The normally on device had to be turned into a normally off device. Normally off can be done by either enhancement mode or CASCO depletion mode. Panasonic developed E-mode, which has several advantages over the CASCO type. A P-layer is diffused under the gate with a resistive connection. We call it GIT or gate injection transistor. The P-layer lifts the potential at the channel and electron movement is blocked. Above the threshold voltage, current is injected and current flow starts again. GIT was Panasonic's first iteration of a normally off GAN device. Okay, so we've talked about current collapse. Now, how do we fix it? How to solve current collapse was the key question. The first approach was the general method of reducing the compressive strain to minimize crystal distortion by fine-tuning the buffer layer and the GAN epitaxial growth, and tuning the layout. 
Though these steps may help, there is no way to eliminate crystal dislocations by process control, thereby no way to completely solve current collapse by process. We found these countermeasures worked up to about 500 volts DC. Panasonic developed a second approach, HDGIT or hybrid drain gate injection transistor by diffusing a second P-dope gate near the drain. The second gate is automatically turned on during the switching period. Trapped electrons are released by holes injected. Current collapse free, dynamic RDS on free was tested, verified, and published at ISPSD 2015 up to 850 volts. 850 volts was the max voltage of our test equipment. It might have gone higher. HDGIT is our core IP for our GAN power devices or the core for the XGAN product line. Okay, so Bob, how do I know if I've really fixed this? That's very important. How to test dynamic RDS on is the most critical test. The test procedure is being discussed at JC70. Different GAN companies are using different test methods. Panasonic's view is to use the more severe inductive test method to stress the devices to cause current collapse. Inductive switch tests allow a large area of device operation to be covered as shown on the voltage current locus curve. Hot carrier electrons are more severely induced to cause severe trapping that contributes to dynamic RDS on increase. This is a better representative test to see if the device is current collapse free versus other test methods using a resistive load. So is this an issue that will get worse as time goes on? Yes. Yes, as time goes on, current collapse can be worse. Current collapse can degrade or become worse with the lifetime of the device as voltage stress and thermal stress are applied to the device. HTRB is a lifetime test. We ran the dynamic RDS on test in parallel with HTRB for 3,600 hours and saw no degradation in the device or any RDS on increase. No other GAN device has been able to achieve these results. We've talked about reliability, but what about being robust? Are these things strong? Yes. On the wish list for power supply designers is to have power devices that have a simple and robust gate design, meaning a robust is to withstand transient voltage. Panasonic adapted a resistive gate connection for the GIT. The resistive connection basically acts like a diode to clamp voltage as shown in the diagram at around 4 volts DC. Transient voltage or noise can be clamped by the resistive connection. Our gate is current controlled and has a wide margin. For example, the 70 milliohm device has a normal operation of 10 milliamps with a max of 50 milliamps and a peak of 1.5 amps. Other conventional E-mode GAN devices use a Schottky connection. The normal operation of 6 to 7 volts DC is a very tight window, and 10 volt peak doesn't leave much room for blowing a device, especially with transients. Panasonic's gate will have a 10 to 20 watt gate loss, a small penalty for a strong gate. Silicon devices have an avalanche capability, don't they? So what about GAN? So another part of the robust design is VDS transients or avalanche capability, as you indicated. Power design engineers have been working with silicon powered devices for many years and know how to design and specify devices for VDS transients based on the avalanche capability of silicon devices. Silicon devices have avalanche capability or additional breakdown energy due to parasitic resistance in the transistor. GAN on silicon is a lateral device and has no parasitics, so we can't put an avalanche number on it. Panasonic's GAN device by design has a VDS of over 900 volts DC for true breakdown. So we added a transient VDS of greater than 750 volts to our specification to help design engineers make the translation to avalanche capability. So what are some of the applications for GAN? What are the advantages here I should be looking for? The advantages of using GAN over silicon are higher switching frequency and lower RDS on. Also, there are topologies or circuit designs that can be done with GAN but can't use silicon. A good example and main topology of interest for GAN is totem pole PFC to replace a classic PFC and dual boost PFC. A totem pole PFC can reduce component count capable of higher switching frequencies, higher efficiency, and a smaller footprint than the old PFC technologies. PFC totem pole with GAN have been achieving 99% plus efficiency numbers. Okay, so can you give me another example? Another application would be on the LLC part of the circuit. Silicon switches hit a wall around 350 kilohertz switching frequency due to high capacitance of the switch. GAN can open the door for very high switching frequencies with high efficiency. Higher switching frequency and efficiency will allow the magnetics, capacitors, heat sinks, and other components to be miniaturized. GAN has very low capacitance, so it can be switched at a high frequency. 
So, Bob, where do you see this coming up in the real world? One of the biggest segments for power supplies is the AC adapters for consumer electronics. Silicon can achieve a power density of 7 to 12 watts per cubic inch with a switching frequency limited to about 250 kilohertz, keeping a reasonable efficiency. GAN can use new topologies such as active flyback clamp, which can provide greater than 40 watts per cubic inch power density, switching at 600 kilohertz plus with high efficiency. This is a 3x reduction in the size of the adapter, so you won't have to carry that big bulky AC adapter for your computer in the future that I see you have. And I, for one, will be happy about that. Well, I think that's all I have time for today. Thank you so much for joining me, Bob. Thank you very much. Also, it was a pleasure to talk about Gan. And before we go, you didn't forget to click that link, did you? There you can find out more information about gallium nitride transistors from Panasonic. For Chalk Talks, I'm Amelia Dalton from eejournal.com. For more Chalk Talks, head on over to the Chalk Talks section of EE Journal or check out YouTube, keyword EE Journal.